I'm Hilary Mantel. I'm the author of The Mirror and the Light, which is the concluding book in the Wolf Hall trilogy. The story of Henry VIII's chief minister, Thomas Cromwell, which takes him from his youth in Putney, through his adventures in Europe, to a position of power as the king's right-hand man and sees him climb to be Earl of Essex. This final book, The Mirror and the Light, tells the story of Cromwell's last four years, in which he rises to unprecedented heights of power, suddenly plummets, is ruined, is imprisoned and executed. The Mirror and the Light is a self-contained book. It begins at the point where Anne Boleyn, Henry's second wife, is executed and it takes us through several more queens, if you like to put it that way. Henry's third wife, Jane Seymour, his fourth wife, Anne of Cleves, and there's a brief appearance by Catherine Howard, the fifth queen to be. And also as a word to the wise for the historically aware reader, the sixth queen, Catherine Parr, appears too. But that's a little mystery for readers to find out. And there are other things for readers to find out too. What is motivating Thomas Cromwell as he rises to unprecedented power, becomes rich, marries his son into the royal family. What's keeping him going? What does he see as the end of this process? And how does he negotiate the everyday nature of government when your master is a volatile and difficult man like Henry VIII. How does he face the king each day? And how does he combat the powerful coalition of enemies that is forming up against him? What are his hopes? What are his fears? And I hope the reader will go with him always questioning the accepted historical narrative, but above all, walking a mile in his shoes, seeing the story from behind Cromwell's eyes. I think with all writing, there's a continual adjustment, um, an adjustment of focus and a movement of attention between inside and outside. One moment you are your character, a few minutes later you are your reader. Uh, you are looking externally to run a check on how what you have written may be perceived. Now there's an extra layer when you're writing historical fiction because you are comparing your instinctive insider perceptions with the historical record as we have it. But having said that, of course, you are also working with that part of history that is forever unrecorded because we never ever know what anyone thought and that is just simply a fact. We know what they said they thought, but there may be a great gulf between what goes on the record and what's actually going on in a person's mind at any one time. My stories are always shifting their focus because I'm always conscious that we're only seeing part of the picture but just outside the ambit of our attention, other things are happening. And the character is attending not only to the person in front of them, 
but also to the voices in the next room. So every moment of our lives, whether real lives or life seen through fiction, are complex, are multi-layered, with constantly shifting focus. Once the Queen's head is severed, he walks away. A sharp pang of appetite reminds him it's time for a second breakfast, or perhaps an early dinner. The morning circumstances are new and there are no rules to guide us. The witnesses, who have knelt for the passing of the soul, stand up and put on their hats. Under the hats, their faces are stunned. But then he turns back to say a word of thanks to the executioner. The man has performed his office with style, and though the king is paying him well, it is important to reward good service with encouragement as well as a purse. Having once been a poor man, he knows this from experience. The small body lies on the scaffold where it has fallen. Belly down, hands outstretched, it swims in a pool of crimson, the blood seeping between the planks. The Frenchman, who they had sent for the Calais executioner, had picked up the head, swaddled it in linen, then handed it to one of the veiled women who had attended Anne in her last moments. He saw how, as she received the bundle, the woman shuddered from the nape of her neck to her feet. She held it fast, though, and her head is heavier than you expect. Having been on a battlefield, he knows this from experience, too. The women have done well. Anne would have been proud of them. They will not let any man touch her. Palms out, they force back those who try to help them. They slide in the gore and stoop over the narrow carcass. He hears their indrawn breath as they lift what is left of her, holding her by her clothes. They're afraid the cloth will rip and their fingers touch her cooling flesh. Each of them sidesteps, the cushion on which she knelt, now sodden with her blood. From the corner of his eye, he sees a presence flit away, a fugitive lean man in a leather jerkin. It's Francis Bryan, a nimble courtier, gone to tell Henry he's a free man. Trust Francis, he thinks. He's a cousin of the dead queen, but he's remembered he's also a cousin of the queen to come.